Antimicrobial Stewardship Part 1, The Crisis of Our Times. I'm Dr. Paul Pottinger. The goals for this lecture are for you to understand that antimicrobial use leads to antimicrobial resistance. The more we use these drugs, the sooner we lose them. You should recognize the need for antimicrobial stewardship in preserving the critical resource of antimicrobials for ourselves and for everyone. At the end of this lecture, you should be angry and alarmed, and I want you to be motivated to do something about this because you hold the solution. We'll talk about that in part two. First of all, what's in a name? Antimicrobials. An antimicrobial is a chemical that's used to kill microorganisms, and there are a number of subcategories within the antimicrobial family. Most commonly used in clinical medicine, antibiotics. Antibiotics are chemicals that come from other microorganisms, usually molds or streptomyces, and we use them to kill bacteria. The classic example is penicillin, uh, the hallmark beta-lactam antibiotic. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin when he came back to his lab, having left it as a mess, working on Staph aureus. He noticed that where bread mold, penicillium mold, was growing, there was no growth of Staph aureus. He thought this was very notable, and he called it penicillium notatum. Subsequently, he realized that there was something in that penicillium, a penicill in, that must be inhibiting the growth of bacteria. This heralded the antibiotic age as we now know it. Antibiotics technically are part of the antibacterial drug family, a subgroup of the antimicrobials. Others are antifungals, antivirals, antiparasitics. They're all part of the antimicrobial superfamily. By convention, when we talk about antimicrobial stewardship, we're usually talking about bacteria. All of the other microbes that are on our list of pathogens for the course, yes, they too can benefit from antimicrobial stewardship because they can, over time, develop resistance to the drugs that we use. By convention, we usually talk about antibiotics in this fashion. Now, I'd like to draw you a timeline of what can happen if we make mistakes with the injudicious use of antibiotics. Case in point, Staph aureus. 1928, Professor Fleming realizes that there's something in penicillium mold that inhibits the growth of Staph aureus. By the early 1940s, this was developed into a clinical drug we call penicillin, and it was used to great effect to treat staphylococcal wound infections during the Second World War. This was a reliable way to go for less than 10 years. By the early 1950s, Staph aureus strains began to show penicillin resistance. PRSA, penicillin resistant Staph aureus, was born. It was a very simple concept. Certain strains of Staph aureus under selective pressure of penicillin would begin to produce uh, hydrolytic enzymes, we call them beta-lactamases or penicillin aces. They are simply there to break open the beta-lactam ring. Once that beta-lactam ring in penicillin is broken, it's no longer effective as a clinical drug. Now listen carefully. Can you hear that scratching sound? I can hear it. That's the sound of Charles Darwin dancing a macarena of rage inside his tomb in Westminster Abbey. What did you think was going to happen if you put a selective pressure on a population that actually has a very short a generational time. You will select out resistant strains. Evolution never sleeps. And we said, oh, but Professor Darwin, we're extremely smart. We have organic chemistry. We're going to take a methylated moiety and put it onto the side chain of penicillin. We'll call it methicillin, and it, th through steric hindrance, will prevent the activity of penicillinases. It'll also fry people's bone marrow. It will hurt their kidneys, but we're going to use it anyway. It'll solve this problem of your penicillin-resistant staph aureus. That was 1959. Methicillin went into use. By 1961, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, MRSA, was detected in Europe, and within less than 10 years, it came to the United States, initially at Boston City Hospital. Now, for quite some time, MRSA was an oddity, and fewer than uh, about 2% of cases of hospital-acquired nosocomial staphylococcal infections were MRSA. The rest of patients could be treated with penicillin and get away with that. Something changed in the early 1980s. Unlike the prior strains of MRSA, there were reports of patients in the community without healthcare exposure who were developing infections with MRSA. They were genetically different, and they tended to present with skin and soft tissue infections such as abscesses, boils, pus in the skin. And intriguingly, they had not been in the hospital, unlike previous patients with MRSA. Well, by 1997, the cat was out of the bag. Hospital-acquired strains were in 50, not 2%, 50% were now MRSA. By the late 1990s, at the same time, this other strain of MRSA, community-acquired MRSA, was gaining predominance here in the United States. 1999, the year that the CDC published an MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, 
chronicling the tragedy of four young, healthy Americans who died of uh, infection due to MRSA. They had presented to primary care doctors, pediatricians, family medicine doctors. They were seen to have a staphylococcal boil. They were given cephalexin or some other beta-lactam antibiotic, and of course that didn't work. They progressed on to bloodstream infections. This was the shot heard around the world telling everyone in the United States, when you think of staph infection, you have to think of MRSA, regardless of whether they've been in the hospital or not. By the late 2000s, the story was very clear. We were losing tens of thousands of Americans either to severe illness or death due to MRSA. Those numbers have slightly begun to decrease in the last few years, but it's still an intolerable burden of that infection. I could draw a timeline for you that looks very much this way with any number of bad pathogens. Uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, the agent of gonorrhea. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the agent of TB. Salmonella enterica cerevar typhi, the agent of typhoid. Time and again, the more we have used antibiotics, the sooner we have lost them. And this graph shows you that whether we're talking about MRSA, vanco-resistant enterococcus, fluoroquinolone-resistant pseudomonas, in our hospitals, the bugs are getting tougher and tougher to treat, and they're becoming more and more predominant. In the United States, we cannot say that there's one particular area that has this as the biggest problem. There is dramatic regional variability with respect to our antibiotic prescription practices. What you see here in darker blue are the higher consuming states on a per capita basis of antibiotics, and in light blue, the less consumption we see. So if you live in West Virginia, on average, you have about 1.2 two courses of antibiotics per people who live in that state. At the other end of the extreme is Alaska, where there is about 0.5 prescriptions uh, per people who live in the state per year, which I would say is a lot less than 1.2 courses per person. On the other hand, that's still a lot of people. Is it true that one out of every two Alaskans needs antibiotics? Is it true that in West Virginia you need more than one course per year? And what is the source of those differences? I think it has to do with culture. I think it has to do with prescription expectations. It may have to do with physiologic factors in the patients too. It's just not clear. What is clear is that coast to coast in the United States, we prescribe more than 300 million courses of antibiotics per year. That's almost one course per person per year. Half of this happens in the hospital, half of it happens in the outpatient setting. And time and again, our success rate as medical doctors in terms of prescribing the right drug for the right indication for the right duration is 50%. Half the time, coin toss, we're making a mistake with antibiotics when we prescribe them. That is completely unacceptable. This happens overseas as well. Here's a picture of Europe. And if we zoom in at any particular nation in Europe and try to predict what their experience will be, it's very clear. Here's a graph. In this case, we're looking at strep pneumoniae, the common cause of pneumonia. On the vertical axis, we have the risk of acquiring a drug-resistant strain of pneumococcus. And on the x-axis, we have the defined daily dose, a standard metric of the consumption of antibiotics. So case in point, if you live in the Netherlands, they don't use a lot of antibiotics and they have a very low risk of acquiring drug-resistant strains of pneumococcus in ES. Well, in Spain, they prescribe a lot of antibiotics and they have the highest risk of drug-resistant pneumococcal infection. So the truth is that on a global perspective, the majority of people who use antibiotics do not even get their antibiotics from a doctor. I took this picture in Orissa in rural India, but you could take a photo like this virtually any place in the world. For most people who think they have an infection, this is what they do. They go to their friendly local chemist. The person inside may be a pharmacist, usually not, very rarely a medical doctor and they're there to serve the community, to provide them with medications. The problem is that they don't have the training, they don't have the diagnostic acumen, and either they're gonna give you an antibiotic that's the right thing, but it's gone off because it hasn't been stored properly, or they're gonna give you the wrong thing. Either way, there's a strong chance that you will not respond well to treatment. I'm using India as a case study because the population is enormous, the need is great, the infrastructure is poor, but there's increasing buying power, upward economic mobility in India. If we look at virtually any class of antibiotic over time in India, the consumption tends to go up. That's true in other nations, but in India in particular, it's a concern because so many of the gram-negative rods that we worry about seem to emerge from India. Carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae are sometimes called doomsday gram negative rods. That's because Enterobacteriaceae, like E. coli, like Enterobacter, they should be susceptible to virtually all of our beta lactam antibiotics, certainly susceptible to the carbapenems. Carbapenems are biggest, baddest drugs when it comes to Enterobacteriaceae. Well, in India, unfortunately, they've consumed so much antibiotics that right now, as of today, a great majority of people with asymptomatic colonization of drug-resistant strains live in India, and that means that if you acquire these microbes through your diet, you may end up with a bad bug. 
that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get sick. But if you do get sick, it can be a real catastrophe. This is a young man called David Ritchie. David Ritchie is a lovely young guy who went overseas after college to volunteer working with children uh, orphaned due to the HIV epidemic there. He was injured terribly. Uh, his leg was cut off by a train, and the people there saved him kept him alive and got him back to Seattle. By the time he arrived here, he had a whole variety of gram-negative rod infections in his stump of his leg that we simply could not effectively treat with any antibiotic. And the only thing that saved his life, frankly, was a series of surgeries amputating higher and higher on the stump of his femur. He is cured, but the quote that he's given us through the ID Society of America, my life consists of watchful waiting and praying that the infection, like some awful type of cancer, does not return. This is the reality for him today, and more and more people are going through this problem, not only in India, but in other emerging economies around the world. And I'm only talking about human medicine. In the United States of America, we have a tremendous appetite for animal flesh, and virtually all the animal flesh that we eat has been produced with the help of antibiotics. Fish, chicken, uh, cows, lambs, you name it. Virtually everything that we eat has antibiotics in it. According to the Alliance for the Prudent Use of Antibiotics, about 80% of antimicrobials are given to farm animals. That's 13.5 million keys per year of antibiotic. It's very rarely given to treat sick animals. It's usually given on a prophylactic basis to prevent infection and uh, perhaps to augment the growth, thickening of the breast meat of a chicken, for example. We don't know why this happens. You do get a thicker, juicier a chicken breast if you feed that animal antibiotics, but the problem is that that drives antibiotic resistance. That flora is sent to us. Campylobacter is the classic example, but there are many others. When you consume animal flesh, number one, you may have uh, that meat that has uh, drug-resistant bacteria on it. Please cook the meat before you eat it. Number two, the practice of doing this in agriculture means that subtherapeutic levels of antibiotics probably do get into the groundwater this is a problem, and it's not necessary. It turns out that organic meat is probably a good thing in a lot of ways. The problem is that in the United States, agro-business and agro-lobbies are extremely powerful. Is it going to be possible for us to break the cycle of antibiotic use in animals? I'm optimistic that we can. It will not be easy. This is happening at exactly the same time when our pipeline of antibiotics is shrinking uh, to unprecedented lows. If we look back over the course of the last century, well, it's been less than 100 years, we've even had antibiotics, and already you can see this incredible paucity of new classes of antibiotics being developed in recent decades. The shrinking pipeline of antibiotics means that in many given years, there will be no new antibiotics approved whatsoever. We need more energy in this problem. So. That's my story to you. We have a rise with respect to nosocomial bad pathogens. We have a shrinking up of our pipeline of new medications. And you're globally minded people. You're concerned about our environment. It should be a natural analogy, I hope, to say that that rise in bad pathogens is like our rise of carbon emissions. The shrinking pipeline of drugs is like our shrinking carbon pipeline. We have to preserve this family of antimicrobials just like we have to preserve uh, our planet for ourselves and for future generations. So my summary for part one of stewardship is that antibiotic resistant bacteria are absolutely on the rise. This is our problem. This is our fault. No one is going to dig us out of this hole. There is no government agency that's going to do this. The WHO is not working on it. At the end of the day, it's up to all of us as clinical medical doctors to make a huge difference here. How do we do that? Follow me, please, onto part two of the lecture. Also, if you want to find some very high-quality web resources, I've listed them for you here as well. Thanks for your attention.